Hello and welcome. In this video, we'll be talking about workaholism and ambition, understanding the link with relational trauma. This is such an important topic, and I'm so excited to share this content with you. But before we get started, let me share a little bit more about who I am and why I'm sharing this with you today. I'm Annie Wright. I'm a licensed psychotherapist and a trauma clinician with a specialty in relational trauma recovery. I'm also the founder of a boutique trauma-informed therapy center. And in addition to this, I'm also an online course creator and a published mental health writer, with my pieces and opinions appearing in Forbes, Business Insider, NBC, and The Huffington Post, among others. Every bit of my work in the world, whether this is through my clinical work, through my online courses, or through content like this that I put out into the world, is designed to support those who come from childhood trauma backgrounds to have the best adulthood possible despite adverse early beginnings. If who I am and what I share resonates with you, please be sure to subscribe to this YouTube channel and sign up for my newsletter in the show notes below. And now, as part of helping you have the best adulthood possible despite how you may have started out in life, we're going to explore today's topic, workaholism and ambition, understanding the link with relational trauma. In this video, we'll cover the following, the intersection of ambition and workaholism, the connection between work addiction and developmental trauma, what exactly work addiction is, how we treat work addiction, how EMDR can help treat work addiction, and prompts to help you explore your own possible workaholism and ambition relationship. Again, before we dive into today's topic, I just want to say that I'm so glad to connect with you, and I truly hope that what I share here can be of support to you. And very importantly, please remember, no matter where you're starting from, change is possible. With that in mind, let's begin this journey together by exploring today's topic. Workaholism and Ambition, Understanding the Link with Relational Trauma. To start, let's discuss the intersection of ambition and workaholism. In my therapy practice, I've noticed a strong reoccurring theme among many ambitious women, particularly those of us with histories of relational trauma. These women find themselves in a complex bind. Their relentless drive for professional, financial, and academic success serves as a means to scale the socioeconomic ladder, get themselves out of challenging early beginnings, and earn some security in the world that may have been lacking in their early childhoods. But this is a double-edged sword for so many of us. While our determination to scale and overcome and achieve is admirable, of course, it's also important to be mindful about when these efforts and attempts may spiral into workaholism a pattern that can create harmful impacts in our adult life, even as it creates positive impacts in other ways. Let's break this down more by exploring the connection between work addiction and developmental trauma. A growing body of research supports the connection between developmental trauma and subsequent addictive behaviors. Numerous studies reveal that early traumatic experiences can lead to significant alterations in brain chemistry and function particularly in areas responsible for stress management, reward processing, and impulse control. To put it plainly, these neurological changes can create a fertile ground for addictive behaviors to take root, kind of like a garden with really well-tilled soil. That's our brain basically well-prepped for addictive behaviors to take place when we come from developmental trauma backgrounds. So what can this look like? Well, those of us who come from relational trauma histories may have an altered stress response system, making us more likely to engage in compulsive work habits as a means to manage feelings of anxiety or stress. Our work environments can also unconsciously provide a structured, predictable space that contrasts sharply with the chaos we might have experienced in our formative years. This sense of control and predictability coupled with the dopamine-driven rewards of accomplishment, can be particularly compelling for those of us with unresolved trauma. Furthermore, the compulsive pursuit of work can serve as a distraction 
helping us avoid confronting painful emotions or memories linked to our trauma. But, of course, this avoidance, while providing temporary relief, can perpetuate a cycle of work addiction as the underlying emotional distress remains unaddressed. Expanding on this, it's important to consider how the strong built-in reinforcement mechanisms within work environments can exacerbate work addiction. Recognition, promotions, and financial incentives can all serve as powerful motivators that reinforce compulsive working patterns, especially when and if our relational trauma backgrounds included an element of financial scarcity too. Between being neurologically primed for addictive behavior, plus having such strong behavioral reinforcements like financial security, a sense of predictability and safety, and receiving distress avoidance as byproducts of working, is it any wonder why working hard can easily morph into a more compulsive form of overwork or workaholism for those of us from relational trauma backgrounds? But how do we tell the difference? How do we know when overworking is becoming workaholism? Well, let's talk about what work addiction is. In my practice as a trauma therapist, I've come to recognize that work addiction, often termed workaholism, although it's not classified as a distinct condition in the DSM-5, has many parallels with other behavioral addictions. I'll highlight a few of those parallels. Some criteria of work addiction might include compulsive engagement in work activities, those of us experiencing work addiction exhibit a persistent, uncontrollable urge to work. This drive exceeds organizational expectations or personal ambitions, becoming a central focus, often leading to an overwhelming number of hours spent on work-related activities. Withdrawal symptoms. Echoing the pattern seen in substance use disorders, individuals with work addiction may face withdrawal symptoms like irritability, anxiety, restlessness, or depression when not engaged in work activities. This indicates a profound psychological and emotional dependency on work for our sense of stability and well-meaning. Prioritization of work over other life aspects. A key indicator of work addiction is the consistent preference for work over personal, social, or leisure activities. This often results in the neglect of relationships, hobbies, and essential self-care practices within the individual's life. Diminished sense of satisfaction. Despite significant dedication and time investment, individuals with work addiction may encounter a decrease in job satisfaction. The relentless pursuit of achievement or perfection can lead to burnout, feelings of emptiness, and pondering the true value and purpose of their work. Impaired social and family relationships. The excessive commitment to work can deteriorate personal relationships, leading to isolation and a sense of disconnection from loved ones. Such an imbalance can provoke family tensions and result in a lack of presence during crucial life moments. Health implications. The persistent stress associated with work addiction can adversely affect physical health, heightening the risk for conditions like cardiovascular diseases, insomnia, and compromised immune function. Ignoring healthcare can amplify these risks further. So again, while workaholism isn't in the DSM-5, the clinical manual that's the bedrock of the mental health field, by viewing workaholism through the lens of parallels with other behavioral addictions, we can start to get a sense personally of whether or not our own relationship to work has veered into this territory. So how do we treat work addiction? For so many of us, including myself, hearing the criterion of what may predispose us to and count as work addiction can be humbling and demoralizing. What do we do if we realize that our relationship with work is more like an addiction than a healthy functional relationship? How do we begin to work through this? In one word, comprehensively. In more words, through brain-based, evidence-based psychotherapy and a rigorous behavioral change plan. Let's break this down further. In order to truly treat an addiction or compulsion, we have to bear in mind the idea that the compulsive activity or substance use is the symptom, not the root. So we stabilize the symptom and then we treat the root causes that led to the addictive behavior or substance use in the first place. 
In my clinical work with therapy clients, stabilizing behaviors as they relate to work addiction might include the following behavioral modifications. Set clear work boundaries. Define specific work hours and stick to them. Avoid working outside of these hours and ensure you have time allocated for rest and leisure activities. Take a thorough look at your calendar and get rigorous about scoping the hours down. Start with the weekends if this is you. Prioritize tasks. Learn to differentiate between urgent and important tasks. Focus on completing tasks that are truly important and avoid overloading your schedule with unnecessary tasks. If this feels hard to discern, I have my clients bring their to-do list to me and we weed through them together. Question your excuses. Do you really need to be making multiple six figures a year? Could you live on less and be happier? Could living on less help you live longer? What are the relational and health costs and trade-offs for the money you earn from workaholic behaviors? Take regular breaks. Incorporate short breaks throughout your workday. Use this time to step away from your work environment, refreshing your mind and reducing stress and reminding you that there is a world and daylight beyond the glow of your laptop screen. Learn to delegate. If possible, delegate tasks to others to reduce your workload. Trusting your team and sharing responsibilities can lessen your burden and allow you to focus on essential tasks. And then working with your therapist to process the triggers that trusting others brings up, also very helpful for personal growth work. Hiring an assistant and building systems so that they can ultimately free you up from work. All of these action steps can help reduce workload that keeps you trapped in an addictive cycle. Seek social support. Spend time with family and friends and don't isolate yourself. Social interactions can provide relief from work stress and offer a different perspective on your work habits. So many of us driven relational trauma survivors think that people who clock out at 5 p.m. and have their weekends free are either unambitious or have their priorities wrong. Be sure to question those thoughts with your therapist and be curious about the contentment levels of those individuals compared to yours. Cultivating a work identity that is part of, but not the entirety of, one self-concept. This can feel foreign to those of us who identify with our professions and derive the bulk of our worth from it. So doing the deep work with your therapist to question your identity apart from work and including it in a normative way is critical for developing a more moderate, healthy, functional relationship to work. So those are the behavioral interventions, the action steps and questions and structural changes I might work with my clients on should they realize they're addicted to work. But the bulk of the clinical work I do to support my clients in treating their work addiction occurs via EMDR, the brain-based, evidence-based psychotherapy I'm personally trained in. Now, let's talk more about how EMDR can help treat work addiction. EMDR, which stands for Eye Movement Desensitization and Reprocessing, is an integrative, brain-based, evidence-based therapy aimed at aiding individuals in processing and integrating traumatic memories, which often underlie addictive behaviors. This method involves an eight-phase process utilizing bilateral stimulation to activate the brain's natural healing processes. For those of us grappling with work addiction rooted in trauma, EMDR offers a path to reprocess our early traumatic memories, alleviating the emotional burden and diminishing their influence on present behaviors. In practice, EMDR can find, desensitize, and resolve memories that subconsciously fuel the compulsion to work, targeting the addiction's root cause and fostering a significant reduction in the reliance on work as a present-day coping mechanism. Combining EMDR alongside behavioral interventions can be a powerful and massively transformative process. So now I wanna share some prompts with you to help you explore your own relationship between workaholism and ambition. It's so ironic that the very thing that once got us out of a bad and secure or painful early environment, an incredible work ethic, prioritizing study and the job over other things, logging long hours, grinding it out, it can, for so many of us, then become an addictive pattern that keeps us from having a good adulthood despite our intent to have secured that for ourselves with the darn work in the first place. But like with so many other ways we coped early on with our relational trauma histories and the intolerable feelings we were struggling so hard with back then, 
Inevitably, the coping mechanisms we develop stop working so well and create more distress in different ways now that we're adults. Speaking as someone who's taking a close look at this in my own adult life and supporting really just the most extraordinary therapy clients through this process too, I've developed a list of prompts and inquiries you can use either on your own or with your own relational trauma therapist to help promote self-inquiry and support you in questioning what, if any, change you may need or want to make in your life. Here are the prompts. How do I define my self-worth and is it disproportionately tied to my professional achievements? Am I using work as a refuge to avoid confronting unresolved emotional issues? Am I using work to avoid painful life circumstances like an unhappy relationship that requires me to make hard decisions? Can I establish and adhere to boundaries with my work or does it dominate my thoughts persistently? When not working or achieving, do I experience anxiety or discomfort? What impact do my work habits have on my relationships and overall well-being? Do I permit myself to engage in and enjoy leisure activities without feeling guilty? When achieving a goal, do I take the time to celebrate or am I immediately focused on the next target? Do I allow myself to delegate tasks or do I feel compelled to handle everything personally? Am I attentive to my body's signals for rest or do I neglect them to continue working? How do my past traumas influence my current relationship with work? What stories am I telling myself and others about why I can't work less? And is that empirically 100% true? What am I afraid of that will happen if I work less? Is that outcome empirically 100% true? What's the cost in two, five, seven years if I keep going the way I'm going? What's the cost on my health, on my relationships, on my ability to actually say that I lived my life? Uncomfortable as these prompts may make you by attempting to answer them honestly and paying attention to what comes up inside of you, you may have the information you need to start, finally, taking a look at your relationship to work addiction so that you can, despite adverse early beginnings, have the best adulthood possible. Always my goal for you. Now I'd love to hear from you in the comments below. Did you resonate with this video? Did you likewise struggle with the fact that the very patterning that once helped you transcend your adverse early beginnings is now making your adulthood feel less satisfying? What have you found to be effective in coping with this? If you feel so inclined, please leave a message below so that others can benefit from your share and wisdom. You never know who on the other side of the world you might be helping when you share your story. Finally, if you're still not sure if this content applies to you, if you're still not sure if you come from a relational trauma history and workaholism is one of the coping strategies you developed in response to your trauma background, I would invite you to take my signature quiz, Do I Come From a Relational Trauma Background? It's a five-minute, 25-question quiz I created that can be incredibly illuminating and will point you in the direction of a wide variety of resources that can be of further help to you. Plus, when you take the quiz, you'll be added to my mailing list where you'll receive twice a month letters from me sharing original high-quality essays with accompanying YouTube videos and audios you can stream, all devoted to the topic of relational trauma recovery and where I share more about me as a person, my life, and how I'm journeying through my own relational trauma recovery and general adulthood. My newsletters are the only place where I share intimate glimpses into my life, including photos, the resources that are supporting me, the things I've discovered that delight me, words that are uplifting me, the practices that nourish me, and more. So please be sure to sign up for my mailing list whether or not you want to take the quiz. I'll link to both of these things in the show notes below. Finally, thank you so much for listening to me today. I Truly hope that even a small part of what I shared felt helpful to you. If you found value in this video and would like to stay connected with my latest content, please consider giving the video a like. It helps more than you know. Also, subscribing to my channel and turning on the notification bell ensures you're always up to date with my newest videos. I appreciate your support and look forward to continuing this journey with you. So thank you. And until next time, please take such good care of yourself. You're so worth it. Mm -hmm.